Hi, I'm Eric Betzig. Hi, and I'm Harold Hess, and uh, I'd like to present uh, today a little story behind a new kind of microscope that we involved, uh, invented, which can take resolution from normal microscope resolution to super resolution, and also give you a little story behind uh, how we came to the idea and uh, it came to pass. So Harold and I have been friends for uh, pretty much over 20 years. I first met him when I went to uh, Bell Labs and joined him in the Semiconductor Physics Research Department. I went to Bell to continue my work from my graduate thesis on the development of the first super-resolution optical microscope called the near-field optical microscope. With that microscope, you were able to, for example, on fixed cells, go from resolution like this in the conventional sense to what you see here in the near-field sense. But probably what's most germane for uh, this talk is with the microscope, I was also able to see for the first time single molecules under ambient conditions and make extended observations and imaging of these molecules um, with a uh, resolution down, or not a resolution, but a localization precision down to about 12 nanometers. Yeah, meanwhile, at, I was also at Bell Labs and I was focusing on scan probe microscopy, but particularly at low temperatures. And this was an exciting field at the time. I was trying a few different variations of scan probe microscopes to sense tunneling current, magnetic field, or electrical field, and actually had a lot of fun with that. But sooner or later, uh, Eric and I decided to join forces and uh, we combined his near field technology, which sort of uh, puts light in a very small diffractive area, uh, together with my low temperature uh, system. And we focused initially on a system called quantum wells, which where you have these little luminescent centers which are supposed to glow. Another way to uh, represent that data is with this little block that you see right here. Uh, where you see X and Y down here, which is real space, and the vertical scale up here is now spectral. Now, so you can see that the uh, spreading the data out in, spec in the spectral dimension really helps us to see these individual luminescent centers and was key to this uh, particular experiment. So while I had a lot of fun uh, with Harold and uh, doing my other experiments with near, with near field while I was at Bell, uh, eventually, I got pretty uh, fed up with the whole thing, in part because of the physical limitations of the near-field technique, and in part because it engendered a really big academic bandwagon, with uh, many people getting into it and the hype greatly exceeding the reality. And um, I got to the point where I said, you know, I really want to try something new. I'm really sick of the whole uh, structure of academic science. And um, so I left and did my first midlife crisis. And uh, while I was uh, thinking, uh, a light bulb popped on. And I thought, you could actually combine the ideas of my single molecule experiment with the quantum well experiment that Harold and I did to potentially create a molecular resolution optical microscope. So the idea would be consider uh, a bunch of molecules here, which are initially not resolved because they're a bunch of fuzzy spots overlap. But again, if they have some feature by which they differ from one another that you can identify, like they glow with different colors, or they blink, or they have different polarizations or whatever, then if you measure those, those parameters, you can isolate the molecules, just like we did with the, quant with the uh, exciton recombination sites. You can isolate these points in this multidimensional space. And once they're isolated, then you can find the centers of these fuzzy balls to much better than the diameter of the fuzzy balls, like I did in the near field technique. And then you're able to project those center positions back to spatial coordinates and basically get a super resolution map of where all the molecules are located. So um, to do that with the technology of the time was going to be very difficult because to be able to see many molecules in one diffraction limited region was going to require very high resolution in that third dimension. You might be able to do it spectrally, but it would have been a hero experiment and I was pretty fed up with, with things at that time. So I went on a completely different tack and started to work for my dad's machine tool company in Michigan. Actually, uh, a year or two later, I also left uh uh, Bell Laboratories. I sort of felt the field of scan probe microscopy was maturing and I thought there were maybe other larger opportunities, particularly in these small little startups which were forming out in California. And at that point I joined this company called Phase Metrics, which does test and measurement equipment for the hard disk drive industry. And I thought some of my nanotechnology imaging experience uh, could both benefit and also give new ideas uh, for myself. So these are some sample machines which check disks or read write heads. 
That company later on got bought out by another one, KLA 10 Core. So that was all a lot of fun, and I even had the opportunity to uh, explore uh, new concepts and actually came up with a, a nice idea, which was uh, got funding and was ready to launch, but it was going to be launched in San Jose. And I was faced with a decision, either move, join this little project, or uh, go back to a bit more research mode. And I was talking with Eric, and I decided in the end that it would be fun to uh, take the more adventuresome path and search for something new, but it wasn't quite clear what. So while I was doing my searching, um, I was uh, trying to think of where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do to get back into perhaps science, because although I learned after seven years in my dad's company, A, that I'm a really bad salesman, but B, that uh, I, I didn't like the academic structure of science, but I really loved the science itself. And so um, I started thinking about uh, different ideas, um, and at the same time... Yeah, I was also contemplating, along with Eric, and we actually had many trips to national parks, trying to figure out where are the opportunities in science, where are the new challenges, where are the untrodden paths. And we sort of were overcome sometimes with a, just a feeling of insignificance compared to the vastness of what's out there. So, um, eventually, uh, although I didn't want to do microscopy, I wanted to try something new and different. Uh, in 2003, I first read a paper about green fluorescent protein, uh, which of course has since, even by that time, was in the process of completely transforming cell biology and many other fields of biology. Um, and honest to goodness, I was probably the last man on earth to learn about GFP, but I immediately realized that this would be transformative not only to biology, but to biological microscopy because of what we might be able to do with it. So in my job searching, I had also contacted a lot of other friends. And one of the places uh, which I visited was Tallahassee, Florida. And there, uh, I thought it might be an interesting place to see whether Eric's idea could possibly fly. And particularly at that place, there's a, a laboratory called the Magnet Laboratory, uh, where we had network and colleagues. And one person there, Michael Davidson, uh, was remarkable. He actually has a, a wonderful website, uh, very comprehensive, and was writing you know, very important uh, reviews of all of the major developments in, in the field. In particular, uh, while we were there, he pointed out there's not just the green fluorescent protein. There are a whole new class of optical highlighters, or photoactivatable, PAFPs. Those proteins, fluorescent proteins, are essentially dark, or maybe off in a different spectral range. and when you uh, normally look at it, you see nothing. But if you shine blue light, you can effectively turn them on. And this was magical. So um, as soon as Harold and I uh, left Tallahassee, it became obvious to us that this was really the missing link to make that idea that I had published after I first left Bell work. So um, the thought is, is rather than bathing the entire specimen with blue light until it all glows, is just turn on the, the blue or purple light for a very brief period of time so only a few molecules turn on at once. Then since they're isolated from one another, we can find their centers and plot those. Then they burn out and bleach and we turn on a new set of molecules by pulsing the light on again and repeat this process for many frames until you determine the coordinates of every molecule inside of the sample. So instead of that original quantum well experiment where we separated the, the exciton recombination sites in terms of x, y, and wavelength, now it's in terms of x, y, and time. So just in case you didn't quite get the Eric's explanation, let me just restate it in plain English. Basically, scoot over just a little bit, right there you see a lot of molecules and they're normally very densely packed, impossible to resolve them uh, clearly. But if you put in a little bit of blue light, you can turn on a very small subset and they're far enough apart that you can see each one glow independently, localize its center. And you repeat this until you exhaust all of the molecules and you can then resolve the uh, complete super resolution image, whereas if they all glowed at once, you would just see a massive blur that looks like this. So once we realized that this was uh, possible, we immediately set off to a quiet place, Sedona, Arizona, 
and wrote up our ideas in a patent and started scheming, how can we make this microscope happen fast? It was an idea which was very ripe and potentially very powerful at the time. And uh, so within about a month or two, we were actually out in my living room assembling, collecting parts and assembling the microscope itself. We were able to sort of bypass the complete funding uh, procedure or venture capital and we were able to move at lightning speed. So within literally a few months, the summer of 2005, Use. This was existing in the living room. But the one missing piece still was, uh, as physicists, we didn't know the first thing about how to do real biology, so we need to collaborate with good biologists. So uh, I had been set to uh, give an interview talk at NIH uh, about the same time, and so when I was there, I, I begged to be able to speak to Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz and George Patterson, who uh, were the inventors of the original photoactivated GFP. And so we uh, clued them in on what the idea was, uh, swore them to secrecy, and asked them if they wanted to collaborate. And they were very receptive and very helpful. And Jennifer uh, offered us uh, not only her help, but lab space and some equipment money and so forth. And so soon we were off and running, not just with the instrument from Harold's lab, but we were able to cart that to, to Bethesda and get started very quickly. So here again is Harold's movie, but now shown uh, with real data, so maybe you'll finally really understand it this time. <laughs> so the frame on the left shows single molecule frames from uh, lysosomes that have been cut through to a very thin section, and then turning on the blue light very uh, briefly in small bursts to turn on small amounts of molecules which are clearly isolated from one another. If you summed up all of those frames, you get the frame in the middle which then represents what you would see in a normal optical microscope. But if instead you find the centers of all of those molecules from the frames at the left and plot them over on the right, then you end up getting a, a, a super resolution image. You can see that a little bit better here where you see in the middle um, on the left um, a diffraction limited image of, of uh, these lysosomes and on the right um, the, the palm image of the lysosomes. And I really appreciate exactly how much the resolution has improved. If you zoom in here, you go from this type of resolution here to this type of resolution here. So this became the basis of our first palm science paper uh, back in 2006. So I thought we'd conclude uh, by just trying to put together some, some thoughts, which I think were actually very helpful for us in, in succeeding. I think both of us have a, a little bit of a aversion for doing um, the mainstream, and so we actively sought out areas uh, which were not very fashionable at all, and uh, tried to just avoid those areas uh, you know, very explicitly. I think for both of us, it was actually very valuable to seek out a diversity of experiences. We sort of bounced through multiple fields, and just experiencing new problem sets from the outside, not just from the immediate research, but from the outside, I think was very helpful and actually very, very liberating for us and made the whole thing a lot of fun. Yeah, and just to reiterate what Harold just said, I, I think one of the key lessons is to not necessarily jump on those bandwagons, like I said, but forge your own path, okay? Um, it, most people who are probably looking at this video have been in science for a while, and if you're a young guy, you're trying to figure out how you're gonna, what you're gonna really do for your career. You've probably invested a lot of time and effort to get to this point. I think it's a, mis a mistake too many people make to try to go the safe route from a funding perspective and whatever to go into the fields that are already fairly mature. Um, the thing to do is to really try, in my opinion, to strike your own path but you have to really have the courage of your convictions to tune out what other people are saying and to n not be upset when you don't get the first grant or two. And, and to try to be a little bit scared because the adrenaline pump also helps in being productive. But really, whatever you do, you should do the thing that you love doing because nothing worthwhile was ever done without passion. <laughs>